Okay, here we go. Question number one. Somebody asked the question, who would date me? Um, now, if you are here tonight and you ask this question, I invite you to make yourself known right now. Are you in the house tonight? Who asked this question? I really hope it wasn't like my wife or something. Uh, I don't believe, no, I'm just kidding. Did anybody, do you want, this is your chance. I am going to bring you up here and we are going to make your phone number public and we are going to give you the opportunity of a lifetime to find a significant other. Who was it? I'm, I'm seeing fingers. Who, who's, was it Justin? There's two Justin. I don't know. Somebody's pointing this way. Nobody going once. Going twice? Was it Mitchell? You can't even do what kind of stuff? You can't send me questions? Oh, right. The, no, the technology thing. Right. Okay. But would you have asked this question? Okay. Do you want to like preemptively planning for the future come and stand up here and allow people the opportunity to get to know you? Okay. He said... Heck no, so we will not do this to Mitchell. Last chance, last chance. You ask the question, I want to answer it, and we want to know the answer. All right, too bad for you. <laughs> You're going to stay single forever. Okay, next question. Just kidding. What age, moving on to something a bit more serious, what age is appropriate for starting to date? What age is appropriate for starting to date? Now, this is a, uh, oh, I am so sorry. Did, do you have this prepared for tonight? Because I'll let you answer every question. I'm kidding, Gavin. Okay, here we go. You ready? Here's my answer. First of all, I would say that it is very important that you honor your parents with this decision. Newsflash and fact check, your parents brought you into this world. And most people would finish that sentence and they can take you out. No, I'm not going to do that. Your parents brought you into this world more than anybody else on the planet. They have invested so much into your life. And, uh, and I think it's all right and very imperative that we trust our parents uh, with decisions like this. Um, and if they feel that you're okay to date at 14 or 15, then I think you're okay to start going out and hanging out with members of the opposite sex and doing that sort of thing. However, if your parents have decided it is better to delay that age, to say, I don't know, 18, which is perhaps the more extreme end of that question or, or that uh, stipulation, I would say don't resist their decision and become rebellious because that brings the displeasure of God on your life and, and takes you out from underneath his hand of blessing. They have reasons for these decisions, and more importantly, God will bless you in your dating life and later on your marriage if you submit. Submission is powerful, and submission brings the blessing of God. It's really easy Maybe if you're in that situation where your parents have said, we want you to hold off for now until you're 18, let's just say. It's really easy to compare and say, well, you know, uh, Jimmy and, and Joanne over there, well, they've been dating and they're like, they're like nine. And uh, <laughs> how is that fair? It's really easy to compare. But when we compare ourselves among ourselves, Paul the Apostle said we are unwise. So that's, that's really important. Uh, there's a blessing that comes when we honor our parents. That's the first thing I want to say. Second thing that I will say is this. I want to answer this question with another question directed at you. And the question is, when do you feel that it is an appropriate age to get married? Just throw out a number. 78? Like, does anybody have any number? Like, 20? Okay, fair enough. 20? Anybody else have another number? 25? 27? 26? Okay, let's just, you know what? Let's just do every number. 20. 21, count with me, 22, 23, make it a dance. Yeah, okay, um, never mind. 100, 100 or below. Okay, just settle down there. So the, the age, I think the average age, I didn't look it up, but I remember from years ago, I mean, people are getting married on into their 30s now, which I think there's reasons for that in secular culture. People, they begin living together uh, before they get married and all that sort of stuff. So there's reasons for the delayed age and getting married. But in a Christian context, I would say early 20s is relatively normal. I was married at 19, and uh, that's not the norm probably, but uh, at least not in this day and age. But that's when I was married. My wife was uh, nearly three years older, still is, by the way. 
That's how math works. And, uh, and she was out of college, had a job, and uh, she was the breadwinner at that time, so we went with it. <laughs> Half true. But if you feel that 22 is the age you're going to get married, you get out of high school, you go through a four-year degree program, you get a job, and now I'm ready. Well, let me ask you a question. If you start dating at 13 or 14, what if you happen to come across the one and you fall in love and you say, I want to spend the rest of my life with this person? And then you've got whatever, a six, seven, eight year gap between that time and the time when you feel you're going to be ready to get married. The next question is, do you feel that you will be able to prolong that emotional connection period and remain spiritually pure and physically pure for six, seven, or eight years? And, and honestly, that is a very difficult proposition. It's not impossible. People do it. But it becomes difficult, okay? So, so again, if you are going to start dating at 13, but then you're going to wait until 25 to get married, I think that is setting yourself up for failure. I've seen it happen many times that people, they just, they get in long-term relationships. The longer you're dating somebody seriously and romantically, uh, the more difficult it becomes the further down that road you go to, to not cross boundaries. I'm not making excuses for people that are in long-term relationships. Even they need to make a commitment to purity. But that's just a little food for thought. If you are 14 and you get involved romantically, you start holding hands and you then move on perhaps to kissing within like the first few dates, and then they, you believe that they are the one, the honest truth is that, that you will have a difficult time for the next five to seven years. And so here's my suggestion. Honestly, now I started dating when I was around 16 years old. But even in retrospect, and, and I'm not saying you shouldn't date at that age, but probably to become seriously, uh, romantically inclined with somebody, probably around 18 actually is a better age. Now, I know to all the 14, 15, 16-year-olds, that seems unfair. But dating has multiple definitions as well. Dating for some is like, you know, being married to somebody, but you're just not living and sleeping together. Now, if that's your definition of dating, like you're so clingy, you just need to stop. You just need to settle down, okay? Because, yeah, can we get a, just a little amen, a witness in the house? You know those people. It's like they start dating somebody, and then they just have no, they just shut all their friends out because they are absolutely infatuated, and it's just annoying. You're annoying if you do that, okay? That's a word for somebody. You're annoying. Everybody around you. Now, I'll just say, if dating to you is hanging out in a group, being very casual, you know, maybe getting together and playing board games or pinochle or something, then you know what? That's, that's fine. That's a totally different definition of dating. It's more innocent. And then, yeah, start a little younger. But if you're going to become seriously, romantically uh, invested in somebody, probably 18 is more appropriate. All right? I would say one last thing. I'm not against people hanging out with members of the opposite sex and groups and maybe sometimes alone in public at younger ages, but when you become deeply connected emotionally, again, I'm reiterating, at 14, 15, or 16, it will be a long, difficult, and sometimes miserable road. Trying to be connected emotionally at like a level 9 or 10, but then trying to maintain physical purity at like a level 1 or 2 until marriage. That's a big discrepancy, and that's difficult. So just keep that in mind. So does that answer the question? It's, it's different for everybody, but just try to keep in mind the, the, the space between when you start dating and when you think you can get married, and try to keep that as short as possible. All right, we good? Okay, good. Thanks, Mitchell. I was just waiting for you, buddy. Okay, question number three. You ready? Is it okay to date other non-Christian girls or boys? Great question. And I would like to answer this, this directly from the Word of God. Because this is something that I know, I know some people, they go down this road and it becomes difficult. The more invested you, you get in somebody in a relationship uh, to then maybe make a turnaround. So let me just hopefully save somebody some heartache uh, in your life. The Bible says, Paul speaking, 2 Corinthians 6.14, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Now, this is a farming reference. For those that don't know a yoke, it was a piece of farming equipment that would connect two oxen together. The two oxen would then have, have a plow or something hooked up to them, and together they would pull it through a field to till the soil. 
And if each ox wanted to go in an opposite direction, then they would get nothing done and there would be zero progress. And so the picture is obvious. Paul said, if you yoke yourself together with somebody, and by the way, that could be just a very close uh, friendship to be yoked together with with a really close friend in the world, perhaps. When you are uh, intimately connected, and, and that can be, again, platonic or romantic, but when you are very connected with somebody uh, and they are an unbeliever, basically you're, you're going opposite directions and no progress is made. And really the relationship will not be meaningful unless somebody changes course and starts walking the same direction as the other person. And unfortunately, so often you see when believers get together with unbelievers, it's often the believers that, that change course and start shifting toward the unbeliever. And I think the reason is because the believer was already to step over verses like this one to be with them in the first place. And if they were willing to bend on that, I guess they'll they'll be willing to bend on more. And so the prophet Amos, in Amos 3 and 3, he kind of, I guess, drills down this point. And he says, can two walk together except they be agreed? Right? So if you want to make Uh, progress and move forward in your relationship romantically or platonic or whatever relationship it is you you really for meaningful relationships you have to have common values that is so critical and so key and the main value that you've got to have common ground on is is the value the values that you have in God and in his word you'll find life very hard hear this I know it's fun. I know you can get emotionally connected to somebody. You can have a good time with somebody and you can go and play games and you can go and bowling or whatever. Or or sometimes you can go further than you ought to go with somebody. And it can be exhilarating and it can be fun. But you will find life very hard if the person you date or eventually are married to doesn't love God and is going the opposite direction as you. That uncommon core value system, it is going to either rip you apart or change one of the two value systems. One of the two of you will begin following the other. And again, usually it's the Christian that falls away from their faith. Right? So let me just make it very plain. And I know that this is the most abrupt way to say it, but based on scriptures like these, and the principles that we read in God's word, it is sinful to join yourself romantically to a non-believer. And you could ask so many people in our church today, adults that are married, And one is in the church, and one is not in the church. And they make it work somehow. But if you were to ask them, is it worth it? Especially if they made that choice uh, to date an unbeliever, and then they got married to them. If you were to ask them, was it worth it? Or, you know, is this an easy life? You know what, they'd probably be honest and say, it's not the easiest life. I wish that we were together. So you know what? Save yourself heartache and make the decision based on the principles in God's word. And it will bless you and help you, and save you so much stress and unnecessary duress. Is that fair? I think think it's so important, and and God wants wants what's best for your life. Amen. Moving right along, question number four. I I don't know if the silence means that you're you're enthralled with the answers or you're sleeping. I can't really tell, Uh, but, but anyway, hopefully there's no drool coming out beneath the masks. Question number four. How should you be treated in a relationship? What qualities should you look for? Two-part question. Is this, is this good? I'm just making sure. Are we good? Okay, good. So let me just kind of break this down. Let me take the second part of this question first. What qualities should you look for in a romantic relationship? To borrow from the previous answer, the first quality that you should look for is whether or not they are a Christian and they love the Lord. That is, that is paramount. And, and I know sometimes that makes it seem like it narrows the pool. And it makes it seem like, well, there's not as many options. Again, you can go beyond that principle, but you're only going to inflict unnecessary emotional heartache on your life. Or you might fall away from your faith. And neither of those things are pleasant. Neither of those things are pleasant, certainly if you're going to lose your soul over, over somebody. So I would go one step further than that and say, Just because someone attends church or you met them at a church function, it does not necessarily mean that they love the Lord. Many people have gotten involved with somebody from church and ended up going down a bad road. And and maybe they were 
you know, had good intentions or they love the Lord at first, but you, you just got to be very, very uh, aware and have your eyes open as you go into relationships. That's, that's just kind of the, the bottom line in any case. But, but again, to kind of, I guess, go one step further with a previous answer as well, I would just reiterate that common interests and common values are, are so important, so important, because those things will last way beyond mere physical attraction. Physical attraction is what gets you interested in one another. That's what kind of, I guess, uh, causes you to take a step toward a person. That's really where it begins. And God wired us that way, to be attracted to members of the opposite sex. That's normal, right? But, but it must go beyond physical attraction to common interests and, more importantly, common values. If your only common interest is each other's physical features then your relationship really won't be that fun. Because physical things may be exciting and thrilling in a moment, but relationships must be built on more than that if they are going to last. And anybody that has ever gone down those roads and, and didn't focus on the values of the interest, they would attest to that fact. Ultimately, you must ask yourself, what do I want out of a relationship? What, what's my goal here? What, what, do I really, what am I really looking for? Do you want something that is fun for now, merely, or fulfilling and satisfying for a lifetime? And I think if we all take a step back from, you know, sometimes we can't see the forest for the tree in our face, and we get so, you know, uh, just our emotions get entangled with somebody, and we become infatuated, and we just lose sight of what really the goal is. And I think if we all take a step back, I think we would all agree that the goal is not to just have fleeting fun that leaves us with pain for the rest of our lives. I think all of us would say what we're really after is something that is fulfilling and satisfying and blessed for the rest of our lives. Is that what we really want? That's what I want. I want something that is satisfying and fulfilling for a lifetime. But here's the catch. The more you choose to have fleeting momentary fun, sinful relationships now, the more it will impact your ability to have those long-term, healthy relationships later. Right? And this is, this is something that we all have to watch for because it's easy to think, well, okay, I'm willing to do what I want now and I'll just pay the consequences later. I'm strong enough. And that is a mentality that will really get you into a lot of trouble. So be careful of that. So that's, that's some things I would say about qualities you should look for in terms of how you should be treated. And oftentimes we focus on how guys treat girls, but, but I, I know it goes both ways. This is something that you need to watch, not just when you first meet somebody, but watch it over time. Because it's easy for somebody to put on an act, right? That's, it's called acting for a reason, right? They, they pretend to be something, to get your attention, to get their foot in the door and get connected and all that kind of stuff, right? But, but they can act really nice for the first little bit in a relationship. It's, it's easy to put on the front for a while, but over time, watch, observe them, and see what qualities leak out in moments of stress, in, in unexpected moments where, I don't know, the tire goes flat or, or, or you know, they have to wait like 10 minutes longer than the than the hostess at the restaurant said. Watch them in those moments where they get maybe a little bit frustrated. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And, and if they get a little bit frustrated and, and anger starts leaking out or vulgarity starts leaking out or, or cynicism or whatever starts leaking out, just, just be careful. Watch it. It will come out over time. Right? How do they interact with their waitresses? Do they, do they just kind of treat them like nobodies? Do they respect their parents? Do, does he respect his mother? You know, a good indication sometimes is, you know, how a guy treats his mother and how a girl treats their father. They might treat you the same way later on down the road. You won't recognize their true character on the first date. I can almost assure you of this, but watch it over time. The obvious thing to watch for in terms of how you should be treated, this is a big one is whether or not they're wanting to push physical boundaries. And if they are, let me just say this. They do not respect you, and they do not love you, because love is patient. Love is patient. Jesus tells us that. Beyond that, they do not respect themselves. 
They do not respect your future marriage or their own future marriage, whether it is with you or with somebody else. Maybe you end up getting married to them down the road, but they set the foundation of your marriage for the rest of your lives together on disobedience to the Word of God. And when you, when you tear down that pillar during your dating phase, it's really hard to rebuild it later. They do not respect you, they do not respect themselves, and they do not respect their marriage, your marriage, or marriage in general. And we are moving shortly into a question about boundaries and relationships, but please allow me to stress this for a moment. What you do physically with people now, it will linger in your life for the rest of your life. Can I repeat that? And, and, and really, my intention and my aim is not to make anybody feel bad, but for the sake of somebody maybe that has not crossed boundaries yet, please let me say, what you do physically with people now will linger in your life for the rest of your life. You may think that the pleasure of crossing boundaries now is worth the challenges later on, but please don't make that mistake. Please don't believe the lie that you will be strong enough and you can deal with it, right? You do not want... And you do not need those hurdles in your marriage later on. And maybe you're right. Maybe you'll be fine. Maybe you'll be able to keep your past in the past. And, and maybe you'll be able to forget about what you did in your previous relationships. And, and maybe you'll be able to move on. But, but what if you decide, you come to a point and you say, well, God, I want to settle down and, and, and I want to be with this person or that person. And, and the question becomes, what if they can't get beyond those hurdles? What if you tell your significant other about your past and, and then they walk away? Your past very well may affect your future spouse for, for many years into your marriage. And so I will just say this, please honor yourself and please honor your future spouse. Please trust that God's way is best because it really is. The principles in his word, if lived out in your life, they will bless you and they will save you from so much hurt. So much hurt. And so one important piece of advice that I will give to you, and then we will move on to the next question. Please listen to the voices around you when you are seeking to be with people and, and get romantically connected. Listen to the voices around you more than your heart. Get, get your close friends that aren't emotionally invested in this relationship, that at least have a semblance of their head on their shoulders and have an objective view to tell you how they feel about that person, right? Do they think they're a jerk? Do they feel like you've changed since you started dating them beyond what is normal? And even more uh, than just your friends, listen to your parents, listen to your pastor. These voices that are in your life, they are from people that actually really genuinely care about your future. So don't resist them and don't shut them out and silence them, but listen to them because your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The prophet Jeremiah said, you don't even understand how evil your heart, your human heart is. So listen to those voices. They aren't trying to ruin your life. They aren't trying to stifle your fun and make it so that you can't enjoy, you know, you know, uh, dating and all that. But they want to see your future preserved. So listen to those voices. And uh, that's so important. We're going to move on. Okay, here we go. Question number something. I don't remember. Are we on number five? I think number five. This is kind of a two-part question. We're going to do these back-to-back, -back, guys. So, so somebody asked, where do you draw the line of things that you shouldn't do in a dating relationship? And then the next question, now this one's more specific, but I, I just want to put it up on the screen and we'll address it. Somebody asked, why do Christian boys think it's okay to ask for inappropriate pictures? So let's just back up and we'll leave the question about, uh, I guess, boundaries on the screen. Um. Now, this is kind of a loaded question because I think everyone has to make wise decisions. And some people, you know your, your inclinations and, and your hang-ups and your hurdles, and you may need to set your boundaries way back here so that you don't cross the boundaries. Some people, you know, maybe, maybe you're a little bit different, and maybe you can hold hands and hug and kiss and whatever, and, then, and you'll be fine, and you'll be able to remain pure until your marriage so it might be a little bit different, but let me just give you a few principles. First of all, let me say the problem with crossing emotional or physical boundaries at its core, not just that it's, you know, 
in terms of physical boundaries, not just that you're disobeying the word of God, but you're getting too interconnected with a person too soon. And if you end up realizing that they are not the one for you, somewhere down the dating relationship road, then it makes it difficult and messy to end things and move on. Right? If you know, if you've shared all of your dirt with somebody, every emotional hang-up, you know, how, how maybe you were abused, or how maybe you've crossed these lines with somebody else, or whatever, and, and you've opened your soul emotionally, or maybe you cross physical boundaries. When you do all these things, you're becoming too interconnected with that person far too soon, and it becomes difficult to, to, to make good decisions and to have sound judgment. Lots of people go too far before the, the timing is appropriate. And again, not just physically. And then their mind and their ability to have good judgment gets clouded by the emotions. Many divorces happen because, and I was listening uh, to a guy named Mark Gungor, a great resource for all things relationships and marriage and whatever. It's really funny, but, but, but he was talking about uh, several examples. People that they marry somebody uh, to whom they became overly connected to in their dating relationship. And when they saw the red flags and they felt to break up, they felt powerless to do so. And they end up getting married and then two months in, they're absolutely miserable and they come to a counselor like Mark Gungor and they say, what do I do? And, and the reason that they're like that is because, again, they open themselves up physically, emotionally uh, before the timing was appropriate, right? The marriage... Uh, the marriage union is the only union that is able to withstand and handle uh, the deepest intimate emotional connections that God designed for a man and woman to experience, right? So when it comes to boundaries, let's get practical for a moment. I would say, talk about boundaries with the person you're with. If you're dating somebody, talk about them. Because if you don't talk about them and you keep them ambiguous, when a moment of temptation comes, nobody knows what too far really is. So you got to talk about them. And, and not just talk to them about them, and this is more awkward, but talk to somebody else about them. Talk to a close friend. Talk to an accountability partner. Talk to a pastor or a parent. Again, as awkward as that may be, talk about it. Put it out in the open. Define it so that you'll know when you come to it or cross it. If you openly declare to each other what the boundaries are, then it won't be ambiguous and confusing when you perhaps are heading into a moment of, of temptation. Right, so here's a few good boundary ideas. These are not, this is not exhaustive, but here's just a few ideas. Um, I would say no sitting in a parked car. And this can be maybe difficult to do all the time, and I understand that, but I was listening to, oh, there's a podcast that sometimes me and my wife will listen to, and uh, they're marriage counselors and dear young married couples, great advice for married couples, but um, they were talking about boundaries in a little Q&A session episode and they said you know when the car goes in park you get out it's a great boundary and it's a practical boundary no being in a house or an apartment alone no closed doors when you're hanging out right because you can be in a house and maybe mom and dad's downstairs or upstairs and you close the door no closed doors uh, go slow with anything physical and and especially if you're going to start dating at a younger age if you're starting to date it at, at 15 or 16 be satisfied with as little as possible for as long as possible, right? And, you know, I remember when my wife and I started dating, like, and there's like that hyper-emotional, like everything, you're walking on cloud nine, and you, does anybody else know what that feels like? It's just so exciting, and neither of you can do anything wrong until you do something wrong, I guess, <laughs> make the other one mad. But holding their hand, it's just, it's everything, you don't need anything else. You feel so happy just to be holding their hand and spending time together, right? And, and then maybe, you, you know, at one point you put your arm around their shoulder, or you give them a hug, or, you know, I'm not against kissing before your wedding day. I'm not against that. Uh, but, but if you're doing that on day one, you're probably going a little too fast, okay? So be satisfied with as little as possible for as long as possible. That's great advice. Great, great advice. Plan your dates, okay? If you're going out on a date with no idea of what you're going to do, that is a recipe for disaster because we have fleshly, carnal desires on the best of days. So plan your dates 
And uh, you know what? Ultimately, what you're trying to do when you're dating is just create opportunities for conversation, right? You just want to be able to talk, get to know one another, discover their interests, discover their value systems, and see if you're in alignment, okay? So, you know, do a puzzle, play a board game, anything that allows you to talk. This is why if all you do when you get together is watch movies together and you're never talking, like, that might be enjoyable, and maybe the film is great, but... You're never talking, so you're never really getting to know one another, at least the way that you otherwise would be able to. So, so you know what? Uh, go buy groceries together and then find a common place, or you know, maybe your parents are home, and then cook a meal together. Uh, go on a double date. Go on group dates. Uh, Clay Cafe is cool. <laughs> Walk downtown, unless it's February and minus 25. Uh, go bowling, and you know, if you have your license and your parents' permission, Go on a, a short day trip that will only take you a few hours. Just do something to create opportunity for conversation. Okay, so really quickly, regarding the question about the inappropriate pictures, this is just good, sound advice, whether you're in a relationship or if it's just a fling or whatever. But if somebody is asking for photos like that, you need to share that information with your parents and allow them to address the issue with the other person's parents. And if your parents are not strong in the church, not strong spiritually, bring it to your pastor. If this happens to be happening with someone within the church, uh, don't only bring it to your parents, but bring it to your pastor as well. Bring it to both. Not only is this sinful and crossing sexual boundaries, but please hear me. When you send something digitally, you have no idea where it may end up. Absolutely no idea. And it is very possible that that person will store your photos long term, even if you break up, and that's certainly not something that you would want. And worse yet, they may share it with others. And situations like this, like these, where, where photos get sent and shared and whatever, it has led some people on an extreme end to even take their own life due to the embarrassment and the shame of things being spread digitally, widespread via the internet. Uh, when you put things out there digitally, especially through third-party platforms like Messenger and Snapchat and other apps, some of these companies, literally in the fine print, they own your photos and you have no idea what might be done with them. So please, you know what, uh, please don't do that. I, even if, <laughs> if you're married someday, it's just not a good practice. It's just really stupid. Uh, I mean, it's, can I just say it's stupid? It is stupid. And, and you're really uh, potentially setting yourself up for a big, big problem. Last question, and then we're going to invite the others to join me. In fact, if, if somebody wants to put a couch here, and put a couch here while I am talking. Maybe these four guys at this front table or these five, whatever. Um, let's just put a couch here while I'm answering this final question. Do you have any tips or advice for the single men of this youth group to find a good Proverbs 31 dime? Now, I couldn't tell if that was supposed to say dame uh, or if dime is the lingo these days. Dime piece? Oh, 10 at oh, 10 out of 10 because a dime is 10 cents. Got it. Okay. I'm learning. So, <laughs> sorry to only address the guys on our final question for tonight. But here's some good practical principles for everybody, no matter what gender you are. First of all, I would say, be the type of person. This is an Andy Stanley quote. Great uh, author and, and evangelical pastor. I believe he's a Southern Baptist. But he said this, be the type of person that the person you're looking for is looking for. Did you get that tongue twister? You have to be the kind of person that the, the person, the ideal person you have in your mind, uh, you know, that when someday I want to settle down with a person like that, don't try to be something different than what they are. Try to be that kind of person. Chances are, if you're wanting to settle down with someone who hasn't been around the block and who hasn't kissed all your friends <laughs> and who hasn't given themselves away to somebody else or multiple people, you know what, there's a good chance that that type of person doesn't want those things either. So don't you go around the block, don't you kiss all the other girls in the youth group, and don't give yourselves away to one or more people. Be the type of person that the person you're looking for is looking for. Now they, they reference Proverbs 31, and so I'm not going to read all the verses, but verse 10 says that she's an excellent woman. Other characteristics, she's content, she's trusted, she leads by example. She's a provider. She wakes up with the right attitude. She's practical with money. She's strong. She fuels her own lamps. 
She's well-skilled. She's compassionate. She's prepared. She's clothed in Christ. She's unified. She's a diligent worker. Verse 24 really lets us know that she's got a side hustle, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. She makes linen garments and sells them. Praise God on the marketplace. <laughs> got that side flow. You know, you need that side flow. She's cheerful for tomorrow, meaning she's hopeful. She teaches with wisdom. She's intentional. She's a woman of integrity. Her husband honors her. She's kingdom-minded. And her actions, they speak for themselves. Is it any wonder that the passage begins with the question, Proverbs 31, verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies, the most precious of gems? Who, who can find somebody like that? And that's what some of you guys might be asking yourself. <laughs> who can find somebody like that? But I come back to my opening point. Rather than trying to find somebody with these qualities, the most important thing that you can do is try to, to develop these qualities within yourself. Because you will attract not what you want, you will attract what you are. You will not attract what you want, you will attract what you are. They say opposites attract, and perhaps in certain arenas of romantic relationships, this is true. But in terms of your character, and in terms of your values, you will not attract somebody opposite from you. You will attract somebody who shares in those things, not somebody from the other end of the spectrum, okay? So opposites attract. You know what? I, I don't know. Maybe in some ways, again, yes. Like, I'm trying to think with us, with Trish and I. What is a way that we are opposite? I don't know. Do you have one? I don't know. Like, I like to do the grocery shopping, which is totally... We're just breaking gender norms here in our, in our house. I like to buy the groceries. It's really just a love... Uh, I love relationship with Costco. That's all it really is. I just love Costco way too much, and I've blown our life savings at Costco. But anyway, um, I don't even know why I'm going down this road. But, but you will attract not what you want. You will attract what you are. And that is the end of our submitted questions up to this point. So can you give it up while I invite my wife, Trish, my lovely, wonderful, beautiful Proverbs 31 wife, Trish, to the stage. Alex and Lana, if you'd come and join us as well. You're going to want to grab a mic behind me. And then we will, uh, literally, guys, the aim and the goal here at this point, if somebody wanted to ask a question verbally, that's fine. Maybe that's embarrassing. And if no questions come in, we can just kind of shoot the breeze and we can talk. Uh, and we can just talk about the questions we've already asked. But uh, we want to give you one final opportunity. If you want to ask how these questions have applied to us personally, if you wanted to ask anything about you know, how we met or how we got engaged, or how I set up Alex and Alana, or anything of that nature, then please, you can text my phone, or you can go to that website, you can submit one anonymously, and uh, nobody will know it was you. So ask away. We'll wait. Do you have anything to say before you started? No, no, I don't. Um, should, 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 uh, should we talk about um, my, uh, my best man speech, how, how like, how I was saying at their wedding, I said, you know, God brought them together, but even more than God, I brought them together. So like I was the reason that everyone was there today. Wasn't that, wasn't that a good moment? Yeah. Yeah, I felt, I felt like I had really accomplished something wonderful. Um, so yeah, anybody have any questions? Do you guys have anything you'd like to say? Anything you'd like to add to any of the questions that have already been addressed? Okay, I have a question, so we're going to move along. Um, I don't know if you guys would like, I've done a lot of talking already, but, uh, and, and maybe this would be something that we can try to address, whether from personal experiences or whether just in principle. How can you get over uh, toxic relationships? Uh, this person said they've uh, tried prayer and that stuff, uh, like spiritual things, but it doesn't seem to be working. So, um, I don't know if you guys have any commentary on how to overcome toxic relationships. Answer so quickly. I, I really want to think through it. Well, I think the first thing, of course, is if you're in a toxic relationship, uh, do yourself a favor and, and leave. Uh, you deserve much better than that. And uh, if they don't honor you and if they don't honor God, you deserve much better than that. So number one is leave. If you're already beyond that point, though, then that sounds like what the situation is. 
you know, one thing I would say, and I, I've said this about many different topics over the years, um, you know, bringing things out into the open, I think, is really important in these sort of scenarios. You know, if you've, you, you don't have to really handle anything alone. So, you know, as awkward as a conversation might be, um, you know, talking about a toxic relationship, I think, you know, opening up to your, to your parents, to your guardian, um, you know, to your pastor and youth pastors, and really just, you know, talking through it, because a lot of people in those situations feel like they've got to keep it quiet. You know, maybe they're doing injustice by, you know, um, talking about what that relationship entailed, why it was toxic, whatever it is. But, but I would say, most importantly, you've got to get over that awkwardness and, and bring things out into the open that are awkward. Uh, you know, don't let those things sit and, and fester in the dark, so to speak, but talk to your parents about it. You know, if, if you're in a relationship or, or you've been out of one, there's certainly nothing wrong with going to, again, your parents or your youth pastor and say, hey, listen, um, you know, I really just need somebody to talk to about some of the things that I've gone through in my, my current or, or in my previous relationship. That's, that's one thing that I would add um, for sure. Do you guys have anything else you'd like to add or should we move on to another question? Surround Here, we can, we can share this mic, so. Yeah. Uh, let's just turn this one on, guys. Yeah, I would say surround yourself with good friends. Maybe think outside of the box. And, um, yeah, if your friends are kind of, like, condoning that relationship and, and they're not telling you what's what, if they're not saying with you, listen, this is not okay, you, you need to find some new friends. And I know that's really hard, but you need people who will say, listen, I can see what's happening in your life right now, and it's not good. Because that's, that's a real friend. So. And your parents, too. Like, I think it's important if, if there is a toxic relationship, then your parents really re need to know so they can, you know, even check up and make sure that that's staying they're staying separate from you and they're not, you know, I know with social media and these days it's hard to kind of keep people away from you or maybe they're harassing you. Your parents can really step in and, and help. So it's good to keep your parents in the loop. Yeah, I think the common theme is, is seek help. You know, don't try to fight it alone because when you try to fight something alone, it's, uh, it can be a very steep uphill climb. A um, couple more, perhaps lighthearted, and then we'll get into a couple others. Not a question, but we need big prayers for Dope Town. We just got a case of COVID. So if we can all just raise our hands right now and uh, pray that Lord Higgs would have wisdom. Uh, okay, just kidding. Uh, I guess, sure, we should do that too. Um, is it okay to flee the country to look for a woman? <laughs> no. I'm assuming that this is the same person that asked, like, how can we find... A Proverbs 31 woman. They're really having a hard time. Aww. It's like, I'll go anywhere. Zimbabwe, Lord, I don't care. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, they're looking for, yeah, for a virtuous Proverbs 31 woman. Okay. So somebody asked a question. And I know, just let me preface the question. One more just came in. Uh, oh, this one's actually kind of funny before we go serious. <laughs> How do I get my friend's girlfriend to leave him for me? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like I feel like we could offer insight here, but I feel <laughs> Honestly, okay. Here's what you have to do. You have to get some of your friends to post really uh, embarrassing and awkward things on their Facebook profile wall, and that does it every time, speaking from personal experience. Okay. <laughs> Taters. <laughs> okay. In, inside joke. It's just a joke. I They're not watching. Okay. <laughs> we need to move on. So let me preface this, this question. This is an important question. I know I've said a lot about the importance of maintaining uh, physical boundaries tonight, and the hardship that you will almost definitely introduce into future relationships. So, you know, if you, if you cross boundaries with one person, it's going to be very difficult to not cross boundaries with the next person. And you just set yourself up for a very 
damaging downward spiral. Um, but also you will do, you'll do harm to yourself and just give yourself so much uh, emotional pain that will last sometimes for a lifetime, right? So, so I know I've talked a lot about those boundaries, but somebody asked the question, um, and, and they said it kind of intensely. Uh, I will maybe soften it a bit, but basically, am I condemned forever uh, if I have sex before marriage? Um, so I don't know if I don't, I don't want to be the only one talking. No, you go ahead. You take that one. <laughs> <laughs> so the ultimate answer is, of course, no, because uh, I know the Bible talks about the unforgivable sin, unpardonable sin of blaspheming the Holy Ghost, which we, we could address that subject, and maybe we will another time. I believe that you can even come from that place and find God's mercy. But at any rate, um, I know sometimes we treat sexual, sexual sins as like the unforgivable sin. I know that there's some cultural ramifications. I know that there's some relational and emotional ramifications that, that linger. I mean, Paul talked about when you, uh, he said, flee fornication for every sin that you do outside of your body. Like if you cheat somebody or lie to somebody or steal from somebody, you're, you're sinning against them and you're sinning against God. But Paul said in that same verse, when you sin sexually, you're sinning not just against somebody else and against God, but you literally sin against your own flesh. And what that means is, I, you know, I believe that you set yourself up for emotional baggage and pain that again lasts a lifetime. And if you don't believe me, um, ask anybody that has maybe been, I don't know, molested or abused. Um, those hurts and pains, they last a lifetime. Those are things that were unwanted. And if sexuality is just no big deal, it's just like any other sin, then tell everyone that's ever been molested to just get over it because it doesn't matter. Either these things are, matter and they affect us or they don't. And the reality is they do. When somebody is assaulted sexually, it lasts and lingers, in some cases, literally until the day they die. They take it to their grave. It hurts that deeply, right? So, so these are important things. When you sin sexually, you sin against your flesh. So that's why we're strong and we say, we need boundaries, we need boundaries, we need boundaries. But the other side of that is God is merciful. And when you sin sexually or if you, if you go all the way and you have sex before marriage, you are fornicating. That is a sin, but you are not marrying that person in that moment. So it's not that you can never get married to somebody else and be successful. The reality is you can get married on the other side of a, of a decision like that and you can find success, but, but you will have more of a hill or a mountain to climb. And so a session like this tonight, the whole purpose of it is to prevent you from having to climb those hills and those mountains. That's it. It's not to say, don't do it, don't have fun. It's not. It's to preserve that innocence in your life and save you the heartache later because we care about you and God cares about you. So, so no, you won't go to hell. Repent. I write into you little children that you sin not, but if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Right? He is faithful. He is just to forgive us our sins if we confess them to him and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we, we are able to bring it to God and be cleansed. But, but do yourself a favor if you have made that mistake, it will be more difficult now because you've opened the door and it's hard to close the door once you've opened it. But, but do yourself a favor and commit from this relationship forward to, to not cross those boundaries again. Um, it, you're, you're doing yourself a favor. You're not doing yourself a favor by enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin that are for a season. You're not doing yourself a favor, especially when it comes to sexual sin. You're hurting yourself. Um, and, and again, you, are, you might be hurting somebody that down the road you have to open up about those things to. And, and they say, I'm sorry, I, I'm done. You know, that's not what I'm interested in. And, 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 then, and then you hurt, they hurt. You don't want to deal with that. So I don't know if there's any other comments. I'll just stop talking. Or maybe I covered it. I don't know. It was very thorough. It was good. Nobody has anything else to say? Not, you know, I, I don't want to, I'm trying to think through this because, again, it's on the fly. And, you know, he had lots of time to prep and research the subject, even for questions that are just coming in now. Um, you know, sin is sin. And, you know, of course, any sin that we commit, you know, outside of blasphemy, which he can cover some other time, um, you know, we, we have the ability to repent and ask for forgiveness and, and turn away from that. Um, 
You know, I, I would just say, you know, in culture and society, in, in the church, it's like it's like we play this game where we where we rank sin, right? It's like, well, sexual sin is is way up here, right? And like swearing or lying, it's like way down here, right? Sin is sin. It's not like there's categories of sin. It's not like there's certain tiers of sin. It's like, ah, it's only a, I, I only lied. You know, sin is sin. And so um, not, to, not to belittle the impact that, that sexual sin has because, because it does, um, you know, you, you're sinning against yourself, against your own body. You know, you're going to carry some of that baggage with you. But, you know, anything that we do, whether it's sexual sin, lying, cheating, stealing, whatever it is, you know, we always have that advocate with the Father that we can repent. And, and you know, if you've messed up and, and, you know, you run to God and ask for forgiveness, he, he's there. He's there. Now, if, you, if you're like, hey, God, I'm, you know, I'm kind of sorry, maybe, kind of sort of, maybe not. You know, that's, that's not true repentance. But when you, when you have committed any type of sin and you just turn around and run from that and say, God, I, I don't want that. You know, I don't want any baggage that comes with doing that sort of thing. I don't want any of the, the hangups that might come down the road. God, please help me. You know, whether it's sexual sin or any other sin, God is there and, and you know, he is able to forgive if we have true repentance. And so I think that, um, again, in, in church culture, we have this, this way of ranking sin. This way of ranking sin. Sin is sin. We don't need to distinguish whether it's, you know, again, a, a, any type of sin. It, it is sin. And so, you know, don't be, you, you should feel the same conviction, you know, when you're, when you're lying to your parents, or, or stealing from the grocery store, you know, as you, as you do when you're, if, you, if you've committed sexual sin, because it's all the same. We, we can't rank sin. We have uh, quiet ladies on the platform. <laughs> We're just so, so good. Yeah, no, that's very true. It's, uh, it can be forgiven like any other, any other sin. So it's never too late to turn around, right? It's never too late to make good decisions. And, uh, and I think sometimes we get into a mindset, well, you know, it's like the binge mentality. I've, done, I've gone here already. What does it matter if I go there again? And it does. It, it just does, right? Because there's a big difference between somebody that steps across the line one time, realizes the error of their ways and turns around, than somebody that has crossed that same line with 50 people. I'm being very uh, outrageous. Um, many, 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 many times. There's a big difference between those two people. There just is. So, I was just going to say, you may have to set your boundaries even, you know, more, you might have to have more boundaries than, than someone else may because, you know, you might fall into that easier than someone else. So, that's, <laughs> that's all I have to say. Yeah. Um, so, somebody asked a question. Uh, I'm here. Actually, this is not a. This is an admission. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> no, hold on. <laughs> I'm deal. here, and I like someone in the room. Wow. So, like our first question, we know you're here. You've declared your presence. <laughs> now is your chance <laughs> to stand to your feet and to declare your love or your like for this other person. They are also here. You have declared that as well. They are in wow. this room. So, you wow. have it. I'll give you 10 seconds. Uh, we will just wait and we'll see what happens. I'm really excited for this moment. Are you, can you, uh, are you able to officiate marriages now? I do have uh, a number from the government for this. So, yes, I, you know Step what? Step forward. Yes. Marcus, hit the music. Who would have known there would be an elopement in the revolution? I thought you had to run away to do that, but I guess you said to come to youth. To elope. Just run to the altar. I guess they have to want to as well. So now's your chance. Do not be a coward. <laughs> well, we know who didn't submit the question because... <laughs> <laughs> technology. <laughs> technology. Yes. Okay, I'm just... I'm checking my email consistently. Well, oh, hold on. Oh, oh. What, that, what was the question? Oh, that was it. It was it a was, declaration. I'm, I'm here and I like somebody and In they're the here? Yeah. Oh, wait. That's it? In the room. I like somebody in the room. So they're both here. We know this can happen right now. So what's the question? I, I'm sorry. here in the room and I like somebody also in the room. Well, question I mark? I have a no, I have a question. And then I said, no, it's actually more like a statement. I did clarify. Oh, before okay. I said. 
And then I get another follow-up question. It's just a phone number. So I don't know if this person has given me the phone number and you just want me to put it out there. Uh, 461-7709. Hold on, I'm calling right now. I think it's coming from over here again. It's Justin Bigger. <laughs> Praise God. All right. Another question came in. Are you guys enjoying this? Do you have anything like intelligent coming through or? Uh, oh, the thing about liking someone was a joke. So they don't like anybody in the room. I guess not. I am so devastated. But are they here? Uh, maybe. <laughs> so somebody asked the question, why do you love Costco so much? I mean, until another question comes in, I guess I might as well answer this one. Do you guys love Costco? We don't have a Costco membership. <sighs> Can you turn up my mic just a little bit, please? <sighs> okay. So the reason I love Costco is because it's basically like a glorified scavenger hunt. <laughs> they intentionally move things around. They just shift pallets around for no reason just to keep me addicted. I've watched it on YouTube. They literally do this. Yes, there are videos like Costco hacks. I've seen many. And I know that if, if like, for example, they change their pricing. And if it's a 99, 0.99, normal price. If it's a 0.97, I believe that means that it's a sale price. If it's like a... Uh, yeah, if there's a star, it means that they're not going to bring back any more in inventory past this shipment, at least for a season. Like that so Frisbee you, game. Right, so you need to act fast. Right? You need to, and the other thing, they show you the, the adjusted price, but they don't show you the original price. Wow. So you have to go often to memorize the prices of everything so that when you go back and you see a lower price, you can be like, okay, that's $30 off. Because if you don't do that, you won't know if it's a good price or not. So you have to go like at least every two days. Next question, please. Okay. 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 That's a good accent. Um, Makes a lot of oh sense. Oh my! This can't be true. I don't even know. I don't want to. I don't want to ask this. I'm not gonna ask it. It's a joke. Um, I feel like the questions are being dominated by okay, okay, the yeah. guys in the room. So, how old were you two when you started dating? That was a question. She was 17, which means I was 18. They followed my advice preemptively. Okay, awesome. So, somebody asked the question, was there ever a moment where you both had to be vulnerable with each other? Were you nervous to be vulnerable? So, I don't know specifically what this question might be getting at, but I'll answer and say, there are definitely moments because we're all human and flawed. There are definitely moments where you have to open up about your flaws and talk about them. And those can be difficult moments. And the truth of the matter is, if you're doing marriage right, I mean, dating is where it starts, but even beyond dating when you get married, if you're doing it right, it's an ongoing, like the Bible in Genesis, when it talks about Adam and Eve, it talks about how Adam knew his wife Eve. Now, of course, that's referring to a sexual connection because he knew her and they bore children. But it's to be known uh, in that marriage context. It's physically, it's emotionally, it's everything. And of course, you know, sometimes that is a, well, most of the time I would say that's a process. So you have to be willing to be vulnerable ongoing. Um, in terms of maybe some of those bigger moments where maybe you have to talk about challenges that you've had or issues from your upbringing or you know, mistakes you've made, certainly those take courage. If I could just say one thing, uh, if, you have, if you've gone down a road that you shouldn't have and you want to talk about that with maybe a significant other, please don't do that on the first date, right? You know, get to a point where you think, I think I want to marry this person because, you know, just practically, you don't need everybody and their dog knowing your, your garbage, and, and your baggage, I don't want to say garbage, your baggage. You don't need that, right? So um, 
just kind of keep it under your belt or under your hat until the time feels right, and uh, and then and then go from there. So, were, were there? I don't know if you want to say anything or if you guys want to comment on vulnerable moments in your relationship. Depending, depending the context of like what you need to talk about. Like, yeah, if it really depends on the situation. So if there is something that is uncomfortable that you need to bring up, but is really important about your relationship, and I'm just going to talk about this because when we first first started dating, there was something that came up that was really upsetting to me. And so I figured, you know what, I'm going to talk to him about it and we're probably going to break up, but that's fine. I need to tell him. And it actually ended up like being the best thing that ever happened to our relationship was by having that conversation that was really uncomfortable. But that's really important. Do you remember that? I mean, vulnerability, yeah, I, do I remember? <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> we're over. <laughs> what, do you want me to tell them all the scenario? My goodness. Hey, here comes all my garbage, everybody. Here it comes. It I'm just teasing. It was totally okay to talk about it right away. Totally, yep. So I guess... I'm not being sarcastic there. I just want to say that, you know, vulnerability, um, my goodness, you know, communicating openly is extremely important, even if it's not something that's fun to talk about, you know. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't stress that enough. You know, I'm, I'm, again, you know, bringing things into the light, not, not, hiding, not hiding things, not, you know, trying to suppress things and, and deal with it, but... You know, if, if there's things that you feel like you need to talk about, um, even if they're maybe a little bit unsettling or, or awkward or just, I shouldn't say, not awkward in like a weird sense, but just, you know, an uncomfortable subject to, to bring up, you know, you just got to do it. I, I've heard people say before, sometimes the, the conversation you need to have the most is the one that you don't want to have. And, um, you know, I've, I can attest to that, that, you know, a lot of times the, the conversations in life whether it be, you know, here or with Alana or at work, the ones that feel like they're going to be the most uncomfortable are probably some of the most important conversations you could have. So again, I couldn't stress that enough to have that, that open communication. And, and, you know, as difficult as it is in the moment to have conversations or, or talk about things that, you know, might make you feel vulnerable, you're going you're gonna to appreciate what comes out of that in the end. Okay, somebody, I just want to address this really quick. I don't really want to get too deep into this. Somebody asked how they can talk about uh, issues of homosexuality like with a friend that just debates on whether or not it's right or good or whatever. Uh, the, the Bible's very clear on those issues. Um, we don't believe that it is a, a biblically right lifestyle. The Bible would identify that as a sinful lifestyle. But like any other lifestyle, um, there's, there's sec- homosexual sin and there's heterosexual sin. So I don't really uh, differentiate between the two, like has already been touched on in this, in this Q&A portion. Um, sin is sin. So it's not something worth singling out in my view and making something bigger than what it needs to be. Um, and a lot of times those people just want to debate. Um, you know, at the end of the day, all I have to say is I, I believe in the biblical perspective on these issues, which is very clear. And and if they don't want to accept the Bible as their, as their foundation, that's their choice. But you've made your decision. So that's, that's really what it comes down to. There are practical societal reasons why homosexuality is not ideal necessarily and why in countries like America it has been a raging debate even beyond when it was legalized. Because, because really what does, like at least with a heterosexual relationship, children are a byproduct of that. That does not come from... A homosexual relationship. So, I mean, there's a reason why the state and the government and should be uh, invested in 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 a marriage between a man and a woman. So, that's uh, there is that practical side to it. So, I just wanted to address that really quickly. I don't know if there's any more comments. Um, so, the person was that asked the question about uh, liking somebody in the room. I think they were actually watching online. They submitted two more questions. So when they said they're here, I think that was here in spirit. Uh, somebody asked, how many people did you date before your spouse? Um, 
I dated really one serious. You dated two. Two. <laughs> I'm on, just trying to count, waiting. man. I'm just trying to count. Just leave me alone. Hold on. Stop. Four. Oh, wait. Okay. Yeah, oh. you, know, you know, honestly, can... Hold on, 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 hold on. Okay. I think I, I, I dated four or five. I can't remember. <laughs> it might have been 12. Honestly, it's just a blur. <clears throat> one for each month that you've been alive. Yeah, just one for each month of the year. I would just, at the end of the 30-day period, i just break up with them, and I just had a rotation, and, uh, you know, it was expensive. Um, that's a joke. Can, can I, I just want to comment on that because I don't know if there's any other questions. I have, I have said before, and if you disagree with me, I really appreciate that, and that's okay because this is just my personal opinion. Um, but, but based on what I have seen, um, and well, also, you know, in, in relationships that I had when I was in like middle school or high school, a lot of relationships the strong, strong, strong majority of relationships, relationships that happen in high school or earlier, honestly, nothing usually comes of them except hurt and pain. And what I mean by that, pain, pain. What I mean by that is this. When you're dating at such a young age, and, and again, Pastor Matt has, has you know, touch, uh, touched on the subject multiple times, you know, it'd be pretty hard to, to date somebody, you know, starting when you're 14 and then get married when you're 22, you know, and maintain purity for, for eight years. I can imagine that that would be a huge challenge. But, you know, those relationships that you have in high school or in earlier, the amount of time that anything comes to fruition, um, whether people go to church or don't go to church, um, is, is almost nil. And a lot of times what happens is, is nothing positive, but you can carry, again, some negative baggage from those relationships. And so, you know, we talk about what is the, what is the appropriate age to start dating. Again, it's, it's not for me to decide for you. Again, you know, rely on what your parents have said um, and what they have allowed for you. But just, just be careful. And, and again, if, you know, if, you're, if you're in the room tonight and you're dating somebody and you're in, in middle school or high school, I'm not saying you just got to go and run right now and across the room and break up with them. It's not what I'm saying, but in my experience from what I have seen of other people, a lot of those relationships don't bring anything positive, but have the ability to bring on a lot of negativity down the line. Amen. And I would just say, one of the most startling pieces of advice that my father ever gave me, and I've shared this here before, he said, date lots of people. And I said, who are you? <laughs> And, I, I listened. And, yeah. And Alex is like, amen, brother. No. Ran I, to the altar. Listen, if you guys are not enjoying this, you can leave. Uh, but we're having so much fun. <laughs> oh, I, thought, I thought they were really going on the front row. I really thought Mitchell was just about to walk out the back door. Listen, I, we don't do this very often. And this is a little bit unique. So we're just kind of enjoying the moment. I hope this is beneficial. Uh, and it may be being beneficial for somebody. So sorry if you're not going to play a little game of Pac-Man after. But... Um, what he meant by that is, you know, the really, the way you get to know about what you want in a significant other and ultimately a spouse is by getting to know the personality types of more than just one person. And it's when you get so like, like we talked about earlier, uh, when you get so like infatuated and emotionally invested in just one person, you shut out everybody else in your life. And, and, and sometimes those, those turn into marriages down the road. Not to say that if you only date one person that, you know, uh, it won't work out. But, but many very casual dating relationships, like going for coffee, hanging out in groups, that will teach you a lot about yourself as you learn about other people. So don't be afraid of dating, but just tr treat dating in the casual way that it was, I think, intended to be treated um, until you become really romantically uh, you know, closer to marriage. Somebody wanted to say, tell all the boys that all a girl needs is a little note and maybe some flowers. We don't need a lot. Then they said, in all caps, that is very important for them to know. And then they corrected no, because they spelled it wrong. Uh, they think it takes so much 
but it's so easy to make a girl happy. She'll read that note you give her a thousand times more. So boys, all you need is a note and some flowers and a driver's license probably would help too. Did Alana submit this question? Uh, it was more of a statement and I'm not okay. going to comment. Feeling conviction. Okay. Good question here. Good question here. Can, somebody, I, can I throw something out there real quick? Like out in the crowd? Yeah, can somebody throw me just a ping pong ball? Just kidding. That's a joke. Um, I haven't heard any questions about like long distance dating. So I'm just, I'm just throwing the subject into the air in case somebody wanted to ask a question about that. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, somebody asked the question, is it okay to have friends with benefits? And no. Short answer, no. No, I don't want to be all long answer. All, all of the struggles and the challenges that we've already addressed with somebody that you are more emotionally attached to, it's only that much more significant and damaging when you have no emotional attachment to them, right? So, um, I mean, that's, uh, the, anybody that asks the question, uh, I think already knows the answer to the question, but just to address it, um, it's, I would say it's even more damaging. It's one thing, you know, if, if God forbid that something like pregnancy were to come from a relationship, that's bad enough. It's even worse if something like that were to happen from somebody that is just total fling. Even if it's not an inappropriate benefit, which I, I don't really know exactly what they mean by that, but it's still not healthy to do that because you have someone else's emotions and, you know, it's just, yeah. I'm, I'm sure it's a joke that someone submitted that. But if if the benefit is like they just, you know, give you five bucks every once in a while because you're good friends or, you know, they buy you coffee. Listen, I've got, I've got lots of friends like that. But, you know, in regards to the subject tonight, no friends with benefits. It is impossible to have benefits without becoming emotionally attached. Impossible. So just uh, food for thought. Okay. Thank you. Some, did you ask that question again? I think, I think somebody asked that question a second time. Uh, I don't know that I have any more questions. <laughs> they, they didn't oh. like the first answer. Hold on, hold on. There's three more. I just want to go through these really quick. Uh, Pastor Woodward is evidently preaching tonight uh, in main service. Um, on the topic of online dating, do you have any unique ways to slide into the DMs asking for a friend? Uh, there is this one guy that I know. He, he, wait, wait. He uses this Max the Dog line way too much. <laughs> Sorry, that was the one I was thinking of. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, okay, comment. Please unpack hey. this. Hey, uh, I, so anyway, there is this this guy. I I I used to know him, and uh, we uh, we had the same babysitter. And uh, anyway, you know what he would do is he would send a, a, a you know an emoji of a dog, you know into uh, into the what we would call the direct message of of a girl. Um, who was uh, well well known, and uh, what? There's more, and they're just all jokes, but they're so funny I can't resist. <laughs> so anyway, you know, he sends this little uh, dog emoji into the into the DMs, and he's like, "Whoa, sorry, my my dog got away from me." Anyway, here I am. My name is. <laughs> uh, and the dog's name is Max. <clears throat> the dog's name is Max. The person's name is <laughs> unimportant. Um, it, it was honestly, man, I, I did see it work one time with a high profile individual and it was actually pretty interesting. Really? Wow. Yeah. So, so far, the, so far the jokes or the remaining jokes seem to be, jo or sorry, the remaining questions seem to be jokes, but can I read them anyway? Yeah. Um, okay. So, so if the guys are taking notes. Uh, are like, you know, write notes and buy flowers. Correct. That's so it. Th th this is actually maybe serious. I'll pose the question. Um, what, are, what are the things that I did that made you fall in love with me? <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> Boast about me. Boast Some about of the things you did? Uh, what do you want me to tell them? Hey, what about the balloons? <laughs> one, one I was there. Matt is like... Like the most random person. We were dating and Matt bought me a Stevie Wonder concert <laughs> DVD. <laughs> like, 
I didn't like have. I never mentioned anything about Hold Stevie on. Wonder ever, and that was one of his Christmas gifts to me. <laughs> and what else did you? She she didn't appreciate it at first, but I would come home because uh, I think well I mean maybe this was after we got we were dating but I feel like after we got married I would come home and she'd be listening to Stevie Wonder. Oh. I'm trying to think what else you did. Uh, oh, he made me. Um, <laughs> I just want to tell them. Give me the mic. He made me. He made me sock monkeys out of out of socks. Handmade, hand sewn. <laughs> what else did you do? Wow. Left candy. But was, were we dating at that point? Left candy on my car when I was. When I, I was know. at work, you'd leave like little what, bags what, of candy. What about I, the time that candy. we blew up all the balloons? Oh, yeah. So on our one year anniversary, I Come took on. Alex. She was one year anniversary, dating anniversary. Uh, she was living over on Samantha Street. And I got the key from, yeah, in Isaiah's dad's current house. Uh, she it used to be owned by somebody else. She was renting the upstairs floor. And so the last bedroom on the right, Alex and I went over when she was at work and we blew up a ton of balloons and we just filled the room with balloons. And then there's video of this. I should, I'll show it next week. If somebody reminds me, I'll show it next week. There's a video of it. And, uh, and the music in the background is, is the lead singer from Switchfoot and his solo projects, John Foreman. Anyway, uh, side note, uh, you guys don't even care. But uh, all of a sudden, so Alex was the cameraman, right? Yeah. I don't remember. Anyway, we were, we were both hiding in the balloons. That's the funny thing. And so, like, it was, I pop it was up, our, and I'm like, hey. It was our one-year anniversary. It, just, it was so strange. So, I was there. So, so she opens the door, and, and all she says is, she's like, oh, my word. And then I pop up, and I'm like, hey. And then Alex pops up, and she's like, Alex is here. What? Anyway. No, but before that, I don't know how long we had been dating, not very long. Matt? Wrote, recorded, oh, no. played a, and played on the guitar a song for me. And we'll play it next week. No, no, I, <laughs> there is a recorded, produced version of this. I don't know where it is, though. Honestly, I, I don't remember. Um, oh, is it on that iPod? It we, is. I found an iPod last Cause it, night. Because sometimes music plays on shuffle at your house. And one time, Alana was there. It was playing. <laughs> Oh, wow. We all cried together. Hey, I know that there's some parents that have come at the back. You can please take a glance. We're just, ha we're just having fun at this point, so can, you guys are more tell, than dismissed. I just want to tell one funny, funny dating story. Okay, go ahead. This is, and if, if anybody needs to go... Please, uh, please feel free to who, leave. About us. In fact, if you guys want to turn the house lights up a little bit more, just, just to make people feel like we're done. We're done. We're just having fun. So go ahead if you want to, please. Can I just... So one other thing I did, so the last... The last 30 or 60 days before our wedding, no. before our something, some significant event, I, te I would text her every night. No, no, no. I, I text you, not a Bible verse. <laughs> oh, oh, was it really? I'm not going to tell you the event because it was so insignificant. It doesn't even matter. But everything's significant when you're dating. <laughs> and I took every text and I wrote it out hand uh, by hand. And I put it in a scrapbook and I gave it to her. It was She's, horrible. No, it was so I'm, horrible. I'm going to give the super, the super pref, like, like condensed version of this story. Go ahead. They're just listening. They're loving it. If anybody needs to leave, all the parents. Is, any, is anybody enjoying this? Anybody at all? Please, anyone. Okay, can I? I just need to tell this okay, funny this story. Last, this is the last story. Last and then we story. Are definitely I'm going to be super quick. Okay, and I'm just going to give you the super like generic version. This one time. What if we did this the, the just week I'm after? trying to I'm trying to tell the question okay. or the tell the story. I feel like we need to come back to this later though. That's all. <laughs> okay, here we go. Thirty seconds. So this one time, Elan and I, uh, when we were dating, we were at my grandparents' house. We were watching a movie, and uh, so I don't even know how we had. Yeah, I don't even know how we had. Uh, oh, moment of silence. Uh, I don't even know how uh, we ended up picking this movie. And you know, 99 times out of 100, I always you know go to uh, plugged in and make sure it's an appropriate movie, which you should do too if you're watching a movie. And so anyway, we had happened to pick this movie because somebody had referenced it, said it was good, whatever. And so uh, as we were watching the movie, uh, one of Alana's uh, 
parents called and said, hey, what are you guys up to? We said, hey, uh, we're, just, we're just watching this movie. And we were only like literally 30 seconds in. And um, within the first 30 seconds, I think we had realized that we should probably shut the movie off because it was, it was a little bit inappropriate. And so we did. But in this, in this time period, uh, her father had called and we said, oh, yeah, yeah, here's the movie title. He said, oh, yeah, cool, right on, sounds good. You know, hung up the phone. And so he called back about one minute later. <laughs> And he said, you come home right now, Alan. I can't believe that you guys are. Now, what he didn't know is in this time period, we had already shut off the movie because we had found out that it was not a good movie to watch. And uh, he wanted uh, Alana to leave and immediately break up with me in that moment. And we, we, we de-escalated the situation by telling him, it's okay. We already shut off the movie because we were misinformed that this was a good movie. And we really did. I'm not lying. I promise. The movie rolled for like 30 seconds. We shut it off. It's all good. It was a really funny story. And, and we survived. And, and here we are today married. It was awful. And he still doesn't like you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> all right. You guys That's are dismissed. That's a big joke. It was a total... What? I said it was a big joke. Yeah, total big joke. He, he, brother, brother. That was the best story I could make up on the spot. I don't know. So in other no, words, Alex true. was not as uh, affectionate as me, evidently. What, okay, you guys are dismissed. God bless you. God bless you, everybody. See you next week for part four. <laughs>